you have a fund dedicated to, well, being short, the currency in Hong Kong and in China to a certain extent, or mostly just Hong Kong? Well, we're not allowed to talk about funds <laughs> as per SEC rules, but uh, let's say we focus on the region. I just think it's important for our viewers to sort of understand it, uh, given we've now, you've sort of become a China expert, at least on our air, certainly, and, and in your various tweets and, and the way you're communicating in the marketplace. What is your sense right now in terms of the growth rate in China and what is really going on with the Chinese economy? Well, I think if you, if you just look to the, the mistake that the Chinese made with Baosheng Bank back in May, you know, uh, prior to May, there was never a concern of, of credit risk or insolvency risk in the Chinese banking system. And in Baosheng's uh, case, they ended up taking down and uh, nationalizing uh, a bank where they haircut interbank depositors by 30 percent and commercial depositors by 30 percent. So deposits started running from, let's say, the small regional banks to the big banks because uh, that's, that all of a sudden credit risk and insolvency risk was brought into the system. So you're seeing China print the slowest GDP growth numbers in 35 years. Right. You saw the July data that was amongst the worst we've seen. And now you have the banking system. They've taken down three banks since May. And um, the last one they took down was a few hundred billion dollars. These are, these are sizable banks. Yeah. Now, you've been talking about, of course, your, your concerns or your belief that the credit system, for lack of a better term in China, is going to potentially crack at some point. Mm. Do you feel like this is a reflection somehow that they're getting closer to that? It always seems as if the Chinese have a way, whether it's lowering rates, whether it's uh, changing the way commercial lenders set interest rate for loans, of figuring out a way to sort of set the, the bar at a different level. Right. I, I think you're right. And, and only, only the Chinese know uh, when this thing's going to go. But, yeah, the way you think about it is if you're as levered as they are, if you have as many assets uh, spinning on plates as they do, and a few plates start falling, it's going to be difficult to keep all the other plates from falling. And I, I feel like you're starting to see some plates fall with their banks. Being and yet it doesn't appear leadership seems particularly concerned in terms of at least trying to enter into significant discussions to get a trade deal hammered out that conceivably would benefit the economy. Yeah, I think they're focused on um, waiting Trump out. And I think, you know, look, we've been talking to the Chinese about trade since January of 2018. You know, look, we're in August of 2019, and we're still talking away. And so uh, I think their, their, their uh, MO is to w try to wait Trump out and, and hope someone that's more pro-China uh, comes in in, uh, in in 2020. And I think, truthfully, I think Trump's political calculus is just to keep talking. If he does a deal that's too easy, he'll be attacked from the right. If he does a deal um, that's in entirely too difficult, they won't sign it. And uh, so I think he'll get attacked from the right and the left if he actually does a deal uh, with China. So I think Although we're just. There does just, seem to be some unanimity politically on this issue, actually, interestingly. There is. Yeah. yeah and you, look, the presidential candidates like, uh, you know, Warren and, and then even the, the, the Democrats like Pelosi and Schumer and uh, uh, a few others have outflanked Trump to the right on China. Yeah. Uh, and they've really stepped into the human rights issue in Hong Kong and said, we need to act. Uh, in helping them preserve freedom and democracy and or, and or forcing the Chinese to live up to another agreement they signed and have, and have uh, with the, uh, with reneged the UK, on of course, with right. the U.K. in 1984. You just brought up Hong Kong. So, I mean, this, the situation appears to be a little more stable than the last time I spoke to you a few weeks ago. The currency has barely budged despite all the options bets and bets like yours against it. So do you still feel like this is sort of the spark that could ignite a bigger fire in China and in Hong Kong? Yeah, I think the Chinese view Hong Kong in a very different way than we do. We know it's their financial center. We know it's where they raise all their dollars. But the Chinese are more interested in their absolute control and having a popular uprising threatening the legitimacy of the Communist Party. So unlike in the U.S., the Chinese can think in non-economic terms, uh, and they think in terms of power. And so I think when you look at 11 weeks of protests, and it's, it's rumored that or estimated that 1.7 million people protested along with our friend Brian Sullivan in the rain uh, this weekend, um, you've had 11 weeks of protests. The Chinese are boxed in. So I think, it's, uh, I think it's a really important time to think about if you were in Hong Kong and you ran a business, would you be investing more CapEx in your business today? Would you be moving family members to Hong Kong or would they be moving away? This process takes a long time to move your life somewhere else. But if you read a number of articles that have come out recently are showing you that, that not only 
are the wealthy moving, but the middle class people are moving too.